You're listening to The Russell Moore Show, and here at The Russell Moore Show, we are bringing you conversations to help you navigate Christian faith in confusing times. And from the last several weeks, including today, we are bringing you conversations on the podcast that revolve around themes in Russell Moore's newest book, Losing Our Religion, An Altar Call for Evangelical America. It's a book that Publishers Weekly says will buoy disillusioned hearts and minds. Losing Our Religion is available wherever you buy your books. So if you're feeling disillusioned and looking for clear-eyed gospel hope, we hope that you enjoy this conversation. Today, Russell sits down with David Brooks. He's a columnist in the New York Times, and they talk about tribalism. And to pique your curiosity, here's just a great line from Losing Our Religion. Russell writes, We live in a time in which truth is seen as a means to tribal belonging, rather than as a reality that exists outside of us. Listen in to this conversation with David Brooks. This is Russell Moore, and you're listening to The Russell Moore Show from Christianity Today. And I'm thrilled to be joined uh, today by David Brooks, a New York Times columnist. And uh, I'll be over at his house here in a little bit uh, talking about uh, Losing My Religion book and other things. And David, thanks for being here. We today. should clarify there's going to be a book party. You're not just coming over to uh, lecture that's right. us. I'm not just coming the, over to <laughs> we'll have to hide here, the silverware. Here's the, here's the book we need to talk about. It. Uh, I, I, you really kicked up some controversy and conversation uh, this past weekend with a column called What If We're the Bad Guys? Uh, for people who missed that, what's the basic gist of yeah. what you are arguing? I should clarify who the we is. Yeah. And so I'm a New York Times columnist, and I write for New York Times readers, and we tend to dis- disproportionately have college degrees, uh, probably overwhelmingly coastal and progressive. And so that's who I was speaking for. And it was basically my explanation for where – it's my core explanation for where we are, not only as democracies in the United States, but across the Western world, which is that in all of these countries – A relatively small group of people, 10 to 20%, have uh, gotten to go to very nice competitive colleges, and then they've married each other, and then they invest, according to studies, about $10 million in each of their kids uh, so they can go to fancy colleges, so they can marry each other, and then those people have kids, and they move to the same few rich metro areas like San Francisco, Denver, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., And so you have a group of the country with about 15, 20%, which has immense economic power, immense cultural power, because we basically control the arts, the cultural institutions, the nonprofits, the media, the academy, uh, and uh, immense political power. And so in each of these countries, um, about 80% of the country, or some percentage, has said, looked at that concentration of power among the educated elite and said, this is wrong. (laughs) They should not be running things. They should not be running things in a way that really serves to preserve their own status and leaves everybody else. And I mean that economically. Now, you know, when I started in journalism, I was in Chicago, it was the 80s. Uh, there were working class people in journalism, people without college degrees. That was, it was sort of a working class profession at some point. Now, not only do you have to go to college, but frankly, 54% of the people at the place where I work or at the Wall Street Journal went to one of the top 29 elite colleges. I was at a little dinner in D.C. here, and we were talking about our backgrounds with five journalists and one newsmaker, and I was the only kid who went to public school. <laughs> like All the others went to some nice prep school. And do you so think, we that, really do you think that's because of the loss of, say, community and local newspapers and, and other outlets, or is it really because of a sorting of elite educations and all of those culture making I think places. it's both those things. I have a friend who grew up in a small town in a small city in, in Tennessee. He said when I was growing up the owner of the local bank lived in the town. Mm-hmm. Uh, the corporate people who were running the companies in the town. Now the owner of the local bank lives in Charlotte uh, and so there's been a concentration of economic power but then even more so we, we have taken profession after profession and said, if you want to thrive in this profession, you better have gone to these schools. And, and even within capitalism, the power of capitalism is moving out of boardrooms and CEOs of companies and moving into the people who do private equity. And those private equity firms are the consulting firms they recruit from Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. Uh, they want that kind of smart young kid who's going to be willing to work eight hours a week, and they have awesome economic power by the time they hit age 50. And so there's been a concentration of wealth, of influence, 
and of recognition in this small, highly educated class. And now if you want to understand the electorate in all these countries, don't look at income levels, which doesn't predict very well who you're going to vote for. Look at education levels. The highly educated are voting more and more as one block. What can be done about that? Well, I think the fundamental thing that needs to be done is we need to redefine what merit is. And so we had a definition of merit, which was not the one I would like back in 100 years ago. Uh, You got into Harvard, Yale, and Princeton if your dad got into Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. It was bloodlines. Mm -hmm. And it was highly discriminatory against anybody who wasn't a wasp. And then in the 50s, 40s, 50s, Harvard, Yale, and Princeton said, we're fighting a Cold War. We need to get smart people here. And so they shifted it to A, IQ, and B, the ability to please your elders between the ages of 15 and 25. Hmm. These strike me as not the best definitions of merit. We want people who are wisdom, who have wisdom. We want people who have different kinds of experiences. We want people of character. Mm-hmm. And yet this highly IQ-based um, definition of merit, plus a definition of merit if you happen to have grown up in a home where your parents can invest huge amounts of money in your education so you have that polish, mm-hmm. then, then you're going to get a highly educated elite, the people who can perform in this way. And when I, I taught at Yale for 20 years, I'm an expert in these, in these students. They're wonderful students. They're great kids. Uh, you were at the University of Chicago. You encountered them. They have subtle abilities. One is they're pretty sure whatever they find in any room they walk into, they'll be able to handle it. Mm. That self-confidence uh, is not universal. Yeah. Two, they have a phenomenal ability to suck up to you if you're a professor while seeming to be cool and friendly with you. <laughs> and three, they have what one, but somebody who taught at St. Paul's, a prep school called Ease. Mm. And that's the ability to navigate highly complex social situations with, while remaining casual mm. and unruffled. And these are things that are bred into people because they come from a certain social class, uh, mm. and, it, and we hire for that. And so it, it's just become a hereditary Brahmin meritocracy. Is the Supreme Court decision on affirmative action going to make the situation worse or better? I'm hoping better. I'm, I, I think there are th- a couple big forces that are really uh, going to disrupt our meritocracy. The first one is artificial intelligence. Mm. We define intelligence as whatever the machines can't do. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the machines are going to be able to do a lot of things we now think of as intelligence, like the compute uh, information processing. And I think it's going to shift. What it's going, the machines are going to reveal who humans are by revealing what they can't do. Mm. And so I think we're just going to take a, have a very different understanding. Second, this shift in affirmative action, uh, which happens at a time when I think everybody understands how corrupt our admissions process has become. We should just not have so many schools where, who draw more students from the top 1% of families than the bottom 60%. That's crazy. Uh, and so I think people need to sh- shake things up. Then there's um, the war on Cold War with China, which is really going to be a technological war. And so it's gonna be, we're going to have to have really broad sector of, of technologists. And so that's, there's going to be, we, we need those people. And then finally, I just think our country, um, and this is my main obsession these days, our country is lost, is becoming dehumanized, partly technology, partly intellectual forces, but the full humanity another, of another person is what's uh, being lost here. And so uh, I think we, we need, I think there's a general recognition we have, to reckon, we have to fight back as humans, as humans who are really good at relating to another human. Did you see the uh, video clip of Mitch McConnell at Fancy Farm, the, the big Kentucky political uh, event, not able to speak for two minutes with yeah. people screaming, uh, resign. Right. And one of the unique things about it is one of the rare bipartisan moments because Democrats and MAGA Republicans are both chanting this. As several people were texting me at the same time saying there's, there's something really mob-like and animalistic about this. And this was from people who – do not care for Mitch McConnell for various reasons at all. Right. Yeah, no, well, it's just a cruel. And, and, yeah. You know, politics ain't beanbag, as we used to say in Chicago, so it's going to happen. Yeah. I kind of think it's going to happen. What I just want, you know, I mentioned my next book, uh, it's called How to Know a Person, The Art of Seeing Others Deeply and Being Deeply Seen. I just want us to get better at the skill. If I meet you, I can make you feel seen, heard, and respected. And we live in a, a culture, I think, it's just an epidemic of blindness where Republicans and Democrats look at each other in blind incomprehension. Depressed people feel they know as knows them. Black people feel their daily experience is not understood by whites. It's just, we, we live in now a, a mass multicultural democracy with a lot of diversity. 
and our social skills are inadequate to the democracy we inhabit. We just have to be a lot better at when we're looking at someone across some difference of being able to get inside their head a little. Not all the way, we're not going to be able mm-hmm. to do that. But to say, yeah, I get you. I get I, a little bit. I get where you're coming from. How can one person do that? If, they, if they've uh, come up in and they're, they're surrounded by a very dehumanizing sort of culture, how do you start to break that pattern? Yeah, well, I've, I've spent four years answering that question. And I, I, in the book, I try to walk people through, like, what gaze? When I look at you uh, or anybody, I'm, I'm looking at somebody made in the image of God. Uh, I'm, looking some, I'm looking a little in the face of God. I'm trying to look at you with the eyes that Jesus used to look at people. That's my ideal. And so that's when, when we meet somebody, and this is just the first encounter, we're each asking a question, often unconsciously, am I a person to you? Do you respect me? And, and the answers to those questions will come in the eyes before they come in the mouth. So even that first gaze is tremendously important. I don't care if you're religious or not religious. Treating other human beings as if they're made in the image of God is a prerequisite for treating them with the kind of respect and dignity they deserve. So that gaze is the first step. But, but then we hang out. How do you hang out? How do we have conversations? We just have to be a lot better at having conversations and turning those conversations into story conversations. And so, for example, I've learned I never ask people, what do you believe about this? Mm. I ask, how did you come to believe that? Mm. And then they're telling me a story. And we, we uh, like here in Washington, we have these Sunday talk shows. And a uh, w- newsmaker gets on, journalists ask a bunch of gotcha questions, they give a bunch of canned answers. I don't know, it's not that interesting to me. Why don't we just say, why'd you get into this? Mm-hmm. I have a friend, Monica Guzman, who says, her, she always asks, why you? Why was it you who did that? And then you, you get a story, and it would just make a better, more interesting shows, in my view, but it would also lead to a better politics. We like, why'd you get it? Why are you doing this? Uh, and then you get the story of their families, you know, some grandfather, grandmother, and influence. And you, you got a human being in front of you. That's really interesting that you mentioned the gays, because right before we came into this room, I was reading an article by a former student of mine about the gaze of second grade awakening preachers. Mm. He was looking particularly at Charles Finney Uh and all of these contemporaneous sources of Finney saying it wasn't his voice, it was his eyes. There were eyes that were able to to sort of almost pierce through a person, which I had never thought about. Yeah, they said that of Sigmund Freud too, that he had these piercing eyes, a little invasive. And then one of my heroines uh, is a woman named Iris Murdoch Mm -hmm. who said, uh, we grow by looking. And she said, our our job as humans is to try to cast what she called a just and loving attention on each other. And um, I read an interview with her, and the woman who did the interview, uh, Martha Nussbaum, a philosopher, um, said, I felt invaded by how closely she looked at me. (laughs) But we'd rather have that than the, you know, the... The, I'm looking behind you, uh, right. uh, then that sort of thing. So that the gaze is really important. And, but then the, the main thing is just becoming really good at conversation. It, and we all think we're good at conversation, but it's very easy to have a mediocre conversation. But to have a conversation where you really felt like you really shared something. I, I did this, my wife, Anne, who you know, um, makes fun of me. But I did a dinner party where we all just answered the question, how do your ancestors show up in your life? And we all have been influenced by our ancestors, but you don't really get to answer that question. And after you explore it with each other, you really do know the other people at a different level. What what conclusion did you come to? What what? How do your ancestors show up in your life? Yeah, well, I you know I, my ancestry is Jewish, and so uh, there are the obvious things that um, you know we we couldn't own property, mm-hmm. <laughs> and so we're book oriented. Uh, when we were in exile, we had a religion based on a place, the temple, and. After we were exiled, we had a religion based on a text. And so we're very book-oriented. But I think the, the main and more subtle thing is that Jews were living in some remote part of a remote part of the remote part of the world. And they declared their loyalty to a book that said they are the center of the moral universe. Mm-hmm. That's just an audacious claim. Mm-hmm. And with that claim comes a sense of responsibility to live up to the covenant and also a sense of pressure, hmm. like God is asking things of us. And I, I think that gets into anybody who has this heritage that there's just this moral urgency to life. 
You know, one of the things dividing us right now are these arguments over wokeness, for lack of a, a better word. And they're, they're kind of conflicting data points. I mean, even right now, I, I saw uh, earlier today Bud Light uh, it lost 10% of its yeah. earnings after the controversy over a transgender uh, influencer who was advertising for them. Barbie, the movie, right. on the other hand, which was slammed by sort of the right, yeah. billion dollar. Right. Uh, are we, is the wokeness war, is it exaggerated? Do we really have those differences between us or is this just another kind of conflict entrepreneur yeah, mechanism? Yeah, I think we're... Uh, as uh, as many people have said, past peak wokeness, mm. and and I measure that just by the ability of what can be said. And I, I do think there was a period in 2020 uh, where at a lot of institutions where I work, I mean, I'm not an expert on a lot, but I work at the New York Times, The Atlantic, Yale, and PBS. I'm an expert at progressive mm-hmm. <laughs> coastal institutions, uh, and so th- I think people were feeling, what can you say? And then I think what happened over the last two or three years, a lot of the people who are liberal, and I mean that in the classical sense, who believe in free speech. Uh, they said, no, we're not, that's not the way this works. We're a journalism institution. We're an academic institute. Truth is paramount. And so free discussion is paramount. And they began to say more. And therefore, the bounds of what we're sayable has expanded. There are still some ideas out there that I think are still as malicious as ever. One of them is um, what they call standpoint epistemology, mm-hmm. that I, you could only know what so-and-so, you, I have my own personal experience, you can't know my experience, you have to be in my standpoint. And that's of course somewhat true, we can't know each other whole, but I believe like a black writer can write a white character and a white character author can write a black character. I think, you know, Othello is pretty good. Uh, and so uh, that idea is still out there. There's still a sense of racial essentialism out there that what you are is a, your white identity, your black identity, your brown identity, that these really determine most about you and that the categories we use, the group categories, are essentially real as opposed to just social constructs. And I think that we're living a wash in generalizations about people because of this. So I think some of the ideas that are coming in, I would recommend a book that's coming out in September by a guy named Yasha Monk, and it's about um, the, the intellectual substructure of wokeness. It's like we all have a vague sense of what it is, but what ideas are really beneath it? And one of the ideas, which I think is still very prevalent in our educational system, is that American society is divided into oppressor and oppressed classes. And when I meet you, I'm, my question for you is, are you an oppressor or oppressed? And that's just too simplistic. That's just a, a permanent warfare category that I think is overly simplistic to a group of human beings who are imperfect and fallen, but most of them trying their best to care for each other. A lot of the tribal debate right now has to do with gender. Do you think that these arguments, I mean, but the Bud Light controversy, right. uh, for instance, do you think that's going to kind of settle out socially? I don't mean theologically, but socially uh, the way that, say, same-sex marriage did? Or is this going to remain a, a key divide yeah. in American life? I think it, it'll settle. I, I think it's become, a, for a lot of people, it, it was just the cutting-edge civil rights issue. Uh, and it's just weird we went from um, – you know, how many trans people call themselves transgender five years ago. Now, if you look at Harvard, Yale, you get, you're getting up to 37, 40 percent of the students suddenly calling themselves tra- transgender. And while at Penn, it's 12. Like, why is it 37 at Harvard at Penn, 12? Or, and, but in the country, frankly, I mean, and I, I may be more left on transgender issues. I'm willing to tolerate, you know, I'm willing to celebrate people, whatever they want to be called, fine. I'm, I'm fine with that. But, um, I, it feels to me that there's just a, a fad almost, especially among the young, to, identi- to adopt this label. And then if you go, like I just spent two weeks in Europe, not much of an issue there. And I just spent, and you go to most parts of the country as, out for, outside of Twitter and social media. Some people are men, some are women, some are gay, some are straight, but it's not like a, it's not like 40% of the people are, have their rights being infringed because they're transgender. It's, it's something we can learn to deal with, but it's just not a huge thing. Um, I was out in West Virginia this past weekend and speaking to a local guy there. He said, if you go to the beer aisle in his gro- department, his grocery store, all the beers are sold out except for a bunch of blue cases for the Bud Light. <laughs> and he said some of the bars around there have begun to serve what they call mystery beer. 
because they <laughs> and it's only like fifty cents on the dollar, and so they don't want to get involved in. They don't want to sell Bud Light over the counter, but they're doing it under the counter as mystery beer. Uh, <laughs> I, it just the culture war stuff. I think is just an excuse to have a war some of the time. Yeah. Yeah. What about on the on the right, if you're looking at young men particularly? I mean, you've, you've seen these surveys that show uh, women, young women, uh, very progressive, relatively speaking, young men, very right, uh, uh, relatively speaking. And it's not the sort of conservative that you or I uh, would have would have been. It's instead often a really hard-edged sort of Andrew Tate misogyny. Uh, and you look at just in the past couple of weeks, there have been three young right-wing um, writers who have been revealed to have uh, anonymous accounts or writings that were blatantly anti-Semitic or, or racist or fascist. Is that where the right is going? Uh, well, I, you mean they're not all reading Edmund Burke? I <laughs> thought it was all uh, they're all doing. Uh, um, yeah, I think I think that's uh, a cause of just the way masculinity has been redefined. And so, first, the definition went away, mm-hmm. and so I, I think a lot of young men grew up in a world of formlessness, and that's formlessness about how to be a decent human being. Like, how do you ask a girl out on a date? Mm -hmm. Or if you're in some sort of dating or hookup relationship, what exactly are you in? Like, when I was, I'm not that old, but when I was in high school, we went steady. Mm -hmm. We asked a girl out, and it was understood we're boyfriend and girlfriend. That means we're going to be exclusive, and we're going to, like, hang out together and that sort of stuff. Now it's a form. It's a voidless form. If you're trying to have a social life in high school or college, there are no categories. There's no formula for how to do courtship, there, let alone a formula for getting married. It's just all, you never know where you stand with people, you never know where somebody's gonna ghost you, and so there's just great insecurity. And then you add on top of that, the fact that women are now doing so much better in schools than men. You add on top of that, we've divi- designed an educational system that really rewards young humans who can't sit still at age nine, who are mostly boys, uh, and then you add on top of that an ideology that says and talks about male toxicity. Uh, and pretty soon you're going to get basically a bunch of people getting red pilled. And so they, those people are not really conservative, they're anti left. And so they don't have a positive conservative vision of the world, but they know that everything the, the, the enlightened thinkers of the educated class believe, they should believe the opposite. And they want to earn their toughness by breaking all the categories. And I don't know if they're racist or anti-Semitic or not, but showing, writing anti-Semitic stuff for a certain bad boy 22-year-old is a way to show, yeah, I'm, I'm hardcore here. And so I, I think it's, I may be naive, but I think a lot of it is performative at this moment. And that I... I but, what, but what a person performs often, that person becomes. Becomes, for yeah. sure, for sure. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I may be optimistic, but I just think a lot of this is going to uh, tone down. Uh, you know, I, I had a friend who was who interviewed a professor who taught at Cornell in the late 60s. And the professor said, you know, in the 60s, you know, bombs were going off. Uh, everyone hated us. They, they were, you know, they were denouncing us. It was like warfare. By 1974, they're all into crystals and est and they're doing new agey stuff. It's just hard to stay passionately angry at the world for long periods of time. These things tend to toned down. And frankly, they get co-opted. And the best parts of these movements, and I would include the new left of the 60s, got co-opted. And I wrote a book in the 90s called Bourgeois Bohemians Mm -hmm. about radicals who then got a job at, you know, working for Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they started with a revolution and we ended up with organic avocado toast, you know. Yeah. And so I was going to- dead music music and commercials. Right, exactly. So I I was thinking of writing a book um, uh, or a, a column- can't wait for the wobos, which would be the woke bourgeois. <laughs> and, and so a lot of the things about wokeness that I like, you know, the awareness of racial injustice and that sort of thing, I think that can get absorbed by the system in a very healthy way. So is Edmund Burke, William F. Buckley, Irving Crystal, all of these varieties of conservatism, is that dead in American life? No, because the ideas are still there. And, and, you know, on the free market side, free market economies are still pretty good. And I would, I would put the American economy, which is more free market than Europe, 
up against Europe any day, up against China any day. You look at just compared to Europe, which is, you know, they have great countries, great economies. But in 1992, we were like slightly above them. Now the U.S. economy is massively above them. We just innovate and grow and produce and attract talent. And so I do think that truth is, is still going to be there. And then I went back a couple of years ago in the midst of the Trump stuff and read all the books that made me a conservative when I was 20. Loved them. Loved them. They were more relevant today than before. And a lot of it is like one, one piece of Burke is epistemological modesty, that the world is complicated. And if you think you can plan society and radically revolutionize it, you're probably going to mess up. So change should be incremental and constant. And so I think that wisdom is still true. The other piece of conservatism that started conservatism is we had the religious wars of the 17th century. A lot of people said, that's terrible. We can't do this. And one group of people said, you know, we, we need to tame religion with reason. And they were the French Enlightenment. Another group of people said, no, no don't trust reason. Our, our capacity for reason is not that great. Trust what they call the sentiments, or what we call the emotions. And so David Hume, this guy said, Scottish philosopher said, reason is and ought to be the slave of the passions. What he meant by that our heart is wise. And they were basically confirming St. Augustine's anthropology's version of the human person, which is we're fundamentally desiring creatures. And we're fundamentally feeling creatures. And our ability to coat everything we see with admiration or contempt, with attraction or repulsion, uh, with envy or joy. The, the, our capacity to do that is superior to our capacity to argue. And so the, the emotions, when properly trained by institutions, my good teachers, my good families, my ch good churches, those are to be trusted most of the time. And so conservatism is really a suspicion of using the power of reason to plan society, but an investment in the power of moral emotions to regulate who we are and to help us join together to collaborate. You know, I hear every day from Christians who will say something along these lines. We made it through 2016, 2020, all of these divisions going on in families and churches. And one person uh, talked to me about realizing they had a family text thread and she realized there were now two family text threads <laughs> and she wasn't right. on one of them. And, and to say all of these things we've sort of lived through and everyone is exhausted by them and now we're coming into 2024 that looks to be a replay of 2020 except with one of the candidates potentially a convicted felon uh, by, that, by that point. How, how are we going to do this again? <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be interesting if exhaustion just finally sets in. Um, you once said something that really resonated with me that the – most spiritually healthy people at any church are not the ones talking. Yeah. And the most spiritually unhealthy person or often are. And I think that rule by minority is common, not only in churches, but across organizations. And they love this. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they, they're they going to be the ones demanding that every pastor in the country be super political. Uh, and so I think it'll, that sense of exhaustion, I don't, I think we're just going to have to live through it and cling to, the strengths of our traditions. And you know, I, I, it's interesting, I came to faith about 10 years ago. And as I mentioned, I came from a Jewish background. And so my first reaction was, um, you know, Christians, you're worried about losing your majority status, you're gonna be down to like 48%. It's like, we're 2%, what are you talking <laughs> about? And it's like, but it's a, being 2% of a country is a great lesson in pluralism. And I think the LDS Church understands that. I think, frankly, the, um, the Quakers understand that. And so there's just going to be a lot of different kinds of people. It's not, a, it's not a problem. You can live at 2%. You can live at 48%. The second thing, and be, I often joke that joining, becoming Christian in 2013 was like investing in the stock market in 1929. It wasn't <laughs> my, the best timing in the world. Right. But, um, but, you know, I looked at, and I really, a lot of my formation came, frankly, from visiting Christian colleges. And I went to dozens of them over the years, way back when I was atheist. And I just would always think, these people feel aggrieved and they feel besieged. But from where I'm sitting, they're wealthy beyond measure. They have the spiritual answers that the whole rest of the culture is hungering for. 
And so, you know, I write these books about character formation and things. And I, I would go to secular places and I would do my shtick and people would be impressed. But then when I go to a Christian college and do my shtick, it was like, we talk about this stuff all the time. <laughs> like, so I had to up my game. And so I, I saw these, you know, going to a Wheaton or a Seattle Pacific or whatever. Um, I see institutions that really have the professors are in their students' lives in the best possible ways. They're not just feeding their brains with pre-professional advice. They're providing advice on how to live and providing excellent advice on how to live based on the Bible, but also based on Wendell Berry, based on a lot, a whole tradition. Uh, and uh, that's what the country is hungering for. And so my lesson, my words to any Christian organization really is be not afraid. You have the wealth. Uh, just you should have an abundance mentality and you get to share 2,000 years of Christian social thought. And there's just so much wisdom there um, that the world, even if they remain secular, is, is hungry for. What about this flip that I've noticed? There was a time, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when urban churches and church plants were the ones who had to deal with constant crisis. You're dealing with poverty, you're dealing with homelessness, you're dealing with addiction. Now, rural churches tend to be on the on the forefront of that. They're dealing with opioid addiction. They're dealing with a uh, brain drain of, of people leaving the community. And those churches are in many ways under siege, but not in, under culture war siege. They're, they're under a real existential threat. How, how does a church like that try to create community against those odds? Well, I would say a couple of things. I, I, I totally agree with you. It, um, I just, today I was, I wrote it. I mentioned in last week's column the how many kids have come from unmarried parents. And it's just, you know, you're, we all know single moms and dads who are doing a wonderful job and their kids are, are going to do great. I, my lesson in life is you only need one. If you're a kid, if you have one person who believes in you, you only need one of those things. But for two parent kids with two parents just have better odds across a whole range of attainments. And so I mentioned that in a column. And a friend sent a chart of where the highest rates of out of wedlock births are. It was the Bible Belt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was the South and bit of the Southwest. And so it's not like and it, it, the bastions of cultural conservatism are the bastions of out of wedlock births. And yeah, as you know, the divorce rate for evangelicals is not lower than right. the secular divorce rate. And you know, for all the tr all the amount of time people of our faith talk about virtue, you'd think we'd behave a lot better than we do. And it's it's frustrating and sobering. My only, and so I, I visit these churches which have, um, or these communities that are really are broken. And I think it's a, and one sees it, and so I co-founded this organization called Weave, the Social Fabric Project. We just go to places and we ask who's trusted here. Mm. And it could be Wilkes, North Carolina, it could be Oakland, it could anywhere, uh, Nebraska, we're all over the country. And if you go into a town and say, who's trusted here? You get the same number of people. And the people will just mention names, and they often mention the same names. So these are, these are actual people, not institutions. Right, actual people, but they're often pastors. And so they have taken the crises as an opportunity. What's, what's a community? A community is a group of people with a common story, but a community is also a group of people with a common project. And so Rabbi Jonathan Sachs asks, why was the creation of the universe covered in like nine verses in Genesis, where the building of the tabernacle is like hundreds yeah. of verses in Exodus? And he said that because G Moses was taking a fractious group of people, 12 different tribes who didn't get along, and they all were doing something together. They were building this tabernacle together. So it was the project that united them. And so in a lot of these communities where the most optimistic places I go, the addiction crisis is the problem that unifies the community. Mm. The out of the taking care of the kids is the problem that organizes the community. And if you go around the country and say, "What's your core problem here?" you get wildly different answers. Uh, once I was in Aurora, Colorado, and it was we don't have enough housing. Then the next day, I went to Youngstown, Ohio. We have too much housing. Mm. <laughs> They've got too many homes. Uh, and so, for a lot of places, it was the opioid addiction crisis, and churches and other community organizations were really organizing around that. In other places, it was the education of the young or whatever it was. But, uh, you know, the problems are problems, but they're also 
common challenges that bring people together because you know you organize around a community or a church around a common love mm-hmm. and primarily it's going to be hopefully love for Jesus but hopefully it's going to be love for our place we love our place um, and uh, you know I ask people when I go around the country at what level of society are you most attached to is it your block your town your county your region your state your nation the world and 80% of the people tell me my town mm. That's really where I, that's where I devote my life to. So this is my town, and I care about it. And so in Wilkes, North Carolina, little town that's like an hour outside Winston Salem or so, um, they used they were the founding of Lowe's Hardware, mm. little the founding of uh, NASCAR, Holly Farms, all those firms left. And so they had their addiction crisis in the '90s, and but they said we're makers, we make things here. And so they've come together and they've now put, their problem was there was no place for people to get together. There was no bowling alley, nothing, mm-hmm. not even a coffee shop. And so now they're creating these places where they can come together as a community. And it's, it's inspiring to see these places rebound. And they, I really think they can rebound. I wonder if you would agree with something that I heard. Uh, the other, I'm not a Jordan Peterson follower by, by any stretch of the imagination, but I, I heard him on Bill Maher's podcast and he said something that I think is completely true, which is that with delayed marriage, delayed uh, childbearing and mobility, that you don't have a situation where there are grandparents nearby. He says, you know, the typical person now is the age previous generations would have been as a grandparent becoming a parent. And so you don't have someone there to say, here are the things to freak out about and here are the things to relax about. And I, I think that's really true, and it's not just applicable to, to child rearing. I see the same thing going on in, in churches. Do you, do you see any way to sort of get these generational connections back together? Yeah, so when, when, I, when I teach my class at Yale, the, the students, whatever the course is nominally called, the students call it therapy with Brooks, because <laughs> we're going to spill our guts about our lives. And I ask, often write, ask students to write about somebody who morally formed them. And it's grandparents. Yeah. It's over and over again. And I was just in a conversational group with two dear friends with my wife. And we all went, took turns to going back and just saying how we were formed. And it turned out the crucial character in all four of our stories was a grandparent. In mine too. Yeah. yeah. And so it's just tremendously important to have that multi-generational families. And so we got out of it. There's a great movie about this process um, called Avalon. About It's by the guy who did the movie Diner. If you remember that movie, mm-hmm, yeah. um, I'm forgetting his name. But he, they're set in Baltimore. And the movie begins with an extended family uh, at a Thanksgiving table, like 60 people. And then halfway through the movie, it's re- reduced to uh, a two parents and two kids watching watching TV Thanksgiving with TV trays. Mm-hmm. The end of the movie is an old guy alone in his senior citizen home. And so it's about the destruction of an extended family down to two one a one generation family or two generation family down to one person, and the good news on that front is that when home builders ask re- residents, potential consumers, home buyers, whether they would like a senior suite in their home, forty percent now say yes, and so they and I know many young parents who grandma and grandpa are going to move here. They have no choice. That's, we, we need them. And I think the number of three-generation families living together after declining for really for almost a century is now on the way back up. And so I think just the power of grandparents is becoming obvious to a lot of people. There are going to be some barriers. And you mentioned some of them, the mobility and stuff like that. But most Americans live within 36 miles of where they were born. Like I happen to be in a class. My parents were college professors where it was normal to go away for, to college. That was like understood. And from, that's not the way most people think. They're right. like, no, I'm, my people are here, my extended family's here, like why would I leave? Yeah. Uh, and, and so I, I, think, I think the less edu- people with more stable, more rooted lives have always understood that. And I think even more mobile people are beginning to understand the power of th- multiple generations. Churches, every year, the statistics are worse and worse in terms of church affiliation membership. And even when a lot of us say, well, this is going to bottom out and level out, it's not so far. Where is that going? Yeah, I think some of it is um, the excessive workaholism of our culture. People now don't want to, they're working seven days a week, parts of seven days a week. 
Uh, parts of it are obviously political. When the, your church basically decides we're on only half the political spectrum, you're cutting in half the number of people that are going to be interested in going to church. Uh, partly, it's frankly, uh, and I'll speak personally, I get frustrated with a church culture that doesn't ask curiosity of me. Mm. And so we had a dear friend we lost recently, Tim Keller. Mm -hmm. Tim was just um, curious. So every sermon was curious. And now I happen to, we happen to be in a period of church shopping, and half the, or three quarters of the sermons are here are Christianity 101. Mm -hmm. It's like, God is love. Yeah, I know. God is love. God is love. It's important, but like, give me a text and like, make me think. Mm -hmm. Make me grow. And so I'm, believe me, I don't write about faith too much because I'm just not qualified. I've been a f man of faith for 10 years. Like, it's just, I'm, uh, but I want to grow. I, I shouldn't, you shouldn't, if I'm going to church and feeling stagnant, then people who have been doing this for 40 or 50 years are really going to feel stagnant. And I just think there's something about pastors who are like, they think they're going after the seekers mm -hmm. and pulling yep. them in. But the people who are in the pews every week want to grow. Mm -hmm. And I find um, that it's just very hard to find a church, which is what my first church has. My first church was my best church with a, a beautiful pastor named Stuart McAlpine and his wife Celia. And it was highly charismatic. So I work in there. I'm coming from an atheist background. I walk in there, hands are in the air. Mm -hmm. And like, oh, well, what's going on here? And then somebody starts speaking in tongues. And then they start translating, and I'm like freaking out. And then they start sort of translating what the tongue expression was, and it was exactly what I was thinking. I'm like, holy cow, yeah. <laughs> what's going on here? So it was super, I want to see the passion. I want to see faith. Yeah. But I also want to have some intellect. I, you know, the, Augustine really thought deeply. It was in, I come from the University of Chicago. I want, I believe in thinking deeply about texts for a greater understanding. And the more you understand, the more you love. Uh, and I often find I don't really get that. So you're probably not surprised that the one denomination growing right now, Assemblies of God, and the one sector of Christianity growing exponentially around the, the world, Pentecostalism. Well, right. No, that's, you, you want the full disease. <laughs> you, you want people who've caught the full disease. And, you know, I, I just, it was so helpful to me. You know, there were, in coming to faith, two things were helpful to me, seeing real faith. Mm -hmm. Not like I in synagogue, I felt peoplehood, and I still feel peoplehood with the Jews. But seeing real faith was just tremendously inspiring, and then seeing faith with the capacity for complexity and doubt. And so, one of the big thing for me was Frederick Beekner, the novelist who mm -hmm. we lost within last year. Uh, he he said, you know, he should. Well, the way he wrote it exactly was, you should get up in the morning and say, "Can I really believe all that again?" And then open the New York Times, he says, and ask yourself again, can I really believe all that again? And he says, if your answer is 10, 10 days out of 10, yes, then you don't have the kind of faith I have. But if it's, your answer is three days out of 10, then that's the kind of faith I have. But on those three days, you should say, yes, I believe it all again with great laughter. And so that, that's, we, you know, we want to see the kind of faith that will just knock our socks off. Dorothy Day, one of my heroes, said a Christian should live in a way that doesn't make sense unless God exists. Hmm. And so you, you want the real stuff. I, I think about Beekner uh, all the time saying, there comes this split second uh, when the preacher gets up and reads the text in which someone is thinking, is he going to address the question, but is it true? Hmm. Yeah. And, and then that uh, tends to dissipate in most, most yeah. cases, but, but that, that's the fundamental question. David Brooks, thanks so much for being here uh, to talk to us today. Always a pleasure, and we'll see you at our home for your book party, which, and we, are, we haven't even mentioned losing our religion. Can I close with sure. one final comment? Since I was at a festival run by a magazine called Plow in mm -hmm. upstate New York, and heard um, you give a talk, which really led to the book, I think. Yeah. Uh, it taught me that I was totally misunderstanding the REM song, <laughs> Losing My Religion. I, I, it didn't mean what I thought it meant. But then you said something which will always remain with me, um, you, it was really a tour de force of what's wrong, what's been wrong, like the book is. But you said somewhere in that talk that they're not leaving the church because they don't believe. They're leaving it because we, they think we don't believe. And that's just a very strong indictment of where we are and what you've been through over the last many years. Well, I think there, there, there could be a better day. 
Yeah, I do too. I do too. David Brooks, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. Executive producers are Eric Petrick, Russell Moore, and Mike Cosper. Host, Russell Moore. Producer, Ashley Hales. Associate producers, Abby Perry and Azure Phelps. Director of Operations for CT Media is Matt Stevens. Audio engineering is provided by Dan Phelps. Our video producer is Abby Egan. And the theme song for The Russell Moore Show is Dusty Delta Day by Lennon Hutton. Mm-hmm.